Hello and welcome to Paleo Logos. I'm Peter and thank you for joining me today as we talk about a fascinating discovery coming out of South Africa. A team of researchers working at the Rising Star Cave System had found the first evidence of fire use by the ancient human species Homo naledi. If you enjoy my content, please make sure to like and subscribe. On September 13 of 2013, two cavers entered the Rising Star Cave System. This is a cave system in South Africa located within the Cradle of Humankind, which is a World Heritage Site which includes many famous paleoanthropological sites as well. But in this particular cave system, no hominin bones were known yet. These two cavers bravely ventured far back into the cave to a nearly inaccessible chamber known as the Dinaletti Chamber. And what they saw was astonishing. Bones were littering the ground. This finding was reported to Dr. Lee Berger, a professor at the University of the Witwatersrand. And Dr. Lee Berger is a paleoanthropologist and was very interested in this. And so he got together a team of researchers who eventually began to excavate these amazing bones. In 2014, Berger and his team released their findings in the journal eLife. And they had recovered more than 1,500 individual specimens that came from about 15 different individuals of different ages, both male and female. And this was amazing to have this large of a sample so that you could compare all of these different individuals at different developmental stages. This is the LES-1 cranium, probably the most complete of those discovered. And it shows us some fascinating features. One of those is the very tiny brain case of Homo naledi. In fact, the brain case ranges from about 465 to 610 cubic centimeters, which is less than half the size of the average modern human brain. One of the other striking features is its facial prognathism, very extreme. The mid and lower face is elongated such that the mouth region sticks far out past the eyes, the orbits. And that's something that once again is quite distinctive in Homo naledi. Here's Homo naledi's hand, and it is quite similar to our own. The individual phalanges and metacarpals and wrist bones are all pretty similar to our own. In terms of proportions, the bones are more like ours than they are like of a chimpanzee, which has extended fingers and a short thumb. And although the proportions aren't exactly modern, they're closer to modern than to something like a chimpanzee, for example. But Homo naledi's hand also shows some interesting features which we typically associate with arboreal creatures. Some of those are like these curvature of the phalanges and the metacarpals. These individual finger bones actually are curved when we look at them. And this is something that we see in arboreal apes. And it's an adaptation to help them grasp branches better. And it's not something that is actually inherited. It's something that actually develops as a creature does that. So infant chimpanzees, for example, don't have this feature. But as they continue to grasp branches, they will develop this curvature of the phalanges. And interestingly, that is a something that we see in Homo naledi. There are also other features of the skeleton which Homo naledi shares in common with arboreal primates, such as the angling of the scapula. So the scapula is this bone back here, and it has the joint surface off of which your humerus, your upper arm bone, articulates and thus rotates. And the scapula of arboreal primates tends to be more cranially oriented, whereas ours is more just transverse, from side to side. But Homo naledi's was more cranially oriented than ours, positioned more upwards, meaning that their arms could have extended upwards better than ours, which is ideal for climbing in trees and also hanging from branches. In addition, when we look at the shape of the rib cage, Homo naledi has more of a conical rib cage. It's peaked at the top, gets wider towards the bottom. Whereas we have a more barrel chested rib cage where it's kind of a similar width all the way up and down. And once again, this is something that we see in arboreal primates. 
Before I get to the recent discoveries, I have to clue you in on one other thing. Homo naledi was found way back in these barely accessible chambers in the Rising Star Cave. Just these tiny little gaps that you have to squeeze through, and these long vertical chutes that you have to drop down. Extremely difficult to get back into these locations. So that raises the question, how was Homo naledi getting back into these chambers, and why was it doing so? The how part seems to be fairly conclusive. Homo naledi couldn't have gotten in any other way than going through the same chutes and tunnels that scientists today have to enter to enter these chambers. But the why question is perhaps the more interesting one. Why exactly was Homo naledi going back here? The assemblage perhaps suggests that this is a deposit for bodies, that Homo naledi was intentionally taking dead bodies and putting them back into this chamber, perhaps as a sign of respect. And that is a pretty fascinating conclusion. It's one that we definitely need more findings to um, strengthen that position, but it's a tantalizing, very intriguing possibility that Homo naledi was intentionally carrying its dead and depositing them in these chambers. And there is some reason, taphonomically, to think so. A part of that is that there will find in certain places isolated skeletons or a skull perhaps on these ledges in the cave, in these alcoves, where they seem to be kind of out of place in these sections. Why exactly would a body get put up on this alcove inside of a cave? How does that normally naturally happen without other members of the group doing that? Other people uh, close to the time of this discovery suggested maybe flooding had put these bodies back there, or perhaps carnivores. But the problem is that carnivores don't actually go way back into caves like this, and most of the carnivores that could drag home in the letty wouldn't fit real well either. In addition, we also have this problem of flooding that there's not really any good evidence for that, and there's probably some pretty big barriers to this having been caused by flooding, dragging these bodies through there. Soon after the initial description of the skeletal remains, controversy broke out. People disagreed about the morphology of the remains and its implications. People also disagreed about the context and whether or not they indicated that it was an intentional deposition of the bodies or not. And perhaps most interestingly, this debate raged quite a bit among young earth creationists. People at Answers in Genesis, such as Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell, and at the Institute for Creation Research, such as Dr. Tim Clary, argued that the remains came from Australopithecines. They weren't human at all, and they shouldn't be classified in the genus Homo. Others, such as Gene O'Mix and Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, suggested that the fossils were chimeric. Uh, the skeletons were, rather. It, it was a mixture of human and non-human bones, and thus it wasn't actually even a valid taxon. Others, such as Dr. John Sanford, Christopher Roop, and Peter Line, tried to argue that the finds were pathological. They were affected by cretinism or microcephaly or some other possible disease. And a final opposing view was that of Dr. Todd Wood, who argued that the remains were non-pathological and came from humans. Now, I think there's a lot of good evidence to say that Homo naledi was human. Skeletally, it's just not feasible to say it was an Australopithecine. Morphologically, it's much more similar to humans than Australopithecines, even though it does share some features with them. The assemblage is also not very well interpreted as a chimeric assemblage, simply because it's very homogenous. When you look and compare the same bones across the assemblage, such as, for example, look at all of the femora, what you'll find is that they're very similar, almost identical to one another, and that's not what you would expect if you have multiple different types of creatures. And we also now have individual skeletons from certain regions of the cave, and we know that all the bones belong to a single individual where we're combining these types of morphology, and so, no, Homo naledi is truly a mosaic. It shares features of both humans and Australopithecines and tree-climbing apes. New findings from the Rising Star Cave system promise to give us a closer look at who Homo naledi was and what their culture was like. Dr. Lee Berger just gave a talk at the Carnegie Institute of Science, and I'll let him tell you for himself what he found. 
And as I was sitting towards the end of the four and a half hours that I spent in there as I was making notes, um, I sat in the middle of the chamber right next to that main excavation, and I looked up. As I looked up and stared at the roof, I began to realize that the roof was not a pure calcium carbonate. That the roof above my head was grayed underneath fresh flowstone. That there were blackened areas across the wall. That there were soot particles across the whole of the surface. The entire roof of the chamber where we've spent the last seven years working is burnt and blackened. So Holman Naledi appears to have been using fire to navigate the cave, and that's a fascinating answer to this question, which we've been asking for quite a while now. If Holman Naledi is human, and it's depositing its dead back in this cave, how is it navigating the cave? Well, it appears that it was indeed using fire. As you can see here, embedded in the flowstone in the ceiling are particles of soot and charcoal that came from a fire. And the whole ceiling, as Dr. Berger described it in the Denaledi chamber, is all blackened. And what's fascinating here is that in the Denaledi chamber specifically, they've not found evidence for harps. And this means that the hominins in the chamber were carrying the fire. Unless further excavations will reveal uh, harps, it appears that this is probably the case. That the hominins, rather than making a new fire every time, were actually carrying it around with them. And this would probably indicate some kind of torch-like item that they were using to illuminate the darkness so that they could transverse the depths of this cave. I climbed down Dragon's Back, and there I met Kanelwe Molopane, who was leading the excavation in the Dragon's Back chamber, who, while I was inside of there, her and her team, had been digging in this spot, that spot where we would often kit up to climb Dragon's Back. And while I was seeing that soot and smoke on the roof of the Dinaletti chamber, she uncovered a hearth and burnt bone. A tiny hearth. A tiny hearth no bigger than a dessert plate with very specific burnt antelope bones in it. Oh, and the very large hearth right next to it. You can see the baked clay along the base of that and the build up over time. So within the dragon back chamber, which is right basically above the Dinaledi chamber, there's a chute that comes out of the dragon back chamber and goes and drops down into the Dinaledi chamber. They found two harps, one small and one large. And these were also associated with antelope remains, which is fascinating because not only were the humans bringing in fire into the cave for light, to see where they were going, they were also eating in the cave. So that is a clear sign of intention. They know what they're doing. They're bringing fire into the cave, which implies that they have to bring wood to keep the fire burning. And they also are bringing meat along with them into the cave to cook and eat it, probably while inside of the cave. I started finding things that we had not seen. Those are stacked rocks, stacked, burnt rocks. The gray that you see at the base of that is ash. There are bones coming out from underneath those stacked rocks where there has never been signs of humans ever. There are no signs of Homo sapiens, Iron Age, Stone Age, or anything beyond the twilight zone of that system. That is the, the open caves. We are in the deepest parts, places that humans in Sub-Saharan Africa don't go. And if that's not convincing for you, how about this? That is part hearth, part waste dump, I believe. You can see the burnt wall on the back side. And what excites, I'm sure, people like Brianna Pobinner, who's sitting there from the Smithsonian, waving her hand, is the abundance of burnt bone that you see all over that, of small animals, very rare antelopes with spiral fractures on them, but no visible stone tools at all. 
Dr. Berger also highlighted some findings from the Lacetti chamber, which is a separate region of the cave from the Dinaletti area. And here they found multiple harps. Interestingly, one of the structures they found here was rocks, which were piled on top of each other, and underneath them were charred animal bones, and the rocks were charred themselves as well. Here you can see a large hearth, where the entire back wall of the cave has this blackened appearance to it, and the floor of the cave is also charred as well, and there's large accumulation of animal bones. Interestingly, Dr. Berger mentioned um, a spiral fracture in one of the antelope bones here. So not only does this tell us that Homo naledi was eating an antelope, it also tells us possibly that Homo naledi may have killed this antelope and the spiral fracture, I'm expecting we're going to see more on that because that could imply a certain type of, of tool, possibly stone tools being used by Homo naledi to kill this antelope. That's just some speculation from me, but that might be where that particular detail is going to be elaborated. The entire floor as we searched in system is covered across the entirety of that system with burnt animal bones, ash, and yes, those black spots. You may be wondering what those are. 250 meters back into a system. I don't think you need a PhD to know what that is. It's burnt wood charcoal. Dr. Berger also pointed out some interesting things about the placement of the fires. In areas where a lot of passageways came together, they often built fires. And in addition, adjacent rooms to those where the skeletons were, there were often harves and animal bones, which seems to indicate they were eating in those particular locations. And this all gives us some fascinating insight, so many possible inferences and ideas to think about. Homo naledi appears to have been navigating these caves with fire, putting fires in particular locations that are more central to kind of provide direction and guidance. And in addition, for some reason, eating back in the cave, why exactly was this? Were they taking such a long time to deposit these bodies that they needed to eat while they were in the cave? Or was this some sort of a ritual meal? We don't know, and those are all just hypotheses and guesses that I've kind of thought about a little bit. But as we continue to excavate in these caves, we have a lot of interesting material yet to find, I'm convinced. And another interesting thing that Dr. Berger also mentioned was the interesting absence of stone tools throughout the cave. Stone tools, he mentioned, were not really found anywhere throughout the cave by these harps. And that's also an interesting observation. Why exactly weren't these hominins using stone tools? Is there a reason why they weren't leaving them in the cave? Were they just too valuable to leave? Well, that doesn't seem to make sense because earlier hominins were also leaving stone tools around. Did Homo naledi just not bring stone tools into the cave because they didn't think they would need them for some reason? We don't know. But these are all the sorts of questions that anthropologists can now consider, now that we have some very interesting evidence, and hopefully we're going to see some more documentation of this in the future. Unfortunately, Dr. Berger hasn't yet released his paper on the subject yet, and so we have only the photographic evidence and what he's told us verbally so far to go off of. So I'm hoping for this paper to come out soon so that we can look at all of this evidence and basically double check their case to make certain that this really was Homo naledi here making these fires. So the picture that we get from Rising Star Cave is that Homo naledi was an intelligent human. It may very well have been burying its dead, but in addition, they were starting fires, which is a human activity, that they were intentionally controlling the fires and carrying them and bringing in wood to keep them alight back into this cave system where it must have been hard to take wood, and also bringing in meat as well and cooking and eating it. All of these are human-like behaviors, and they give us a very interesting perspective on Homo naledi, and it's one that I'm interested to see how people respond to, especially, for example, people at Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research, where they've already come out arguing that Homo naledi is non-human, and yet now we have evidence that it's displaying these 
complex characters that they would have otherwise associated with humans. And so it's going to be interesting to see how these different people respond to this evidence. And I am fascinated, can't wait for more information on this to come out. If you've enjoyed this video, please make sure to like and subscribe and also check out the full lecture if you're interested in what Dr. Berger had to say.